Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the aid of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that attentive to your word, we may confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. Uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live in serving and peace of life to the honor and glory of your holy name. Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive the forgiveness Christ won for you by his passion, death, and resurrection. By the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, as a called and ordained servant of the word, I declare to you the forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray and give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things which we are conscious is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except for the merit of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship. Please indicate your presence here this morning by using one of the we're glad you're here cards that you'll find in the rack in front of you in the pew or you can do so by using the qr code that you'll find on the back of the bulletin please simply place those in either of the offering baskets that you'll find on either end of the pew welcome once again to worship in god's house today ladies there's two opportunities i want to highlight for you first is a new study that is beginning on Thursday evenings at 6.30. The study is going to take a look at six psalms, and that starts on the 26th of this month, and also a one-day retreat here at the church on August 28th, beginning at 8 a.m. You can sign up for those opportunities on our website, mylwlc.com. If you have a child or a grandchild that is age three through high school, Please note that there are three informational meetings for a new vision of the youth ministry. It's called Faith Alive. And please uh, sign up to attend one of those meetings. Call the church office or you can just drop uh, an email. Sign up through our website. Please note the various times. Those are important meetings. The directors have been working very uh, hard uh, this summer uh, on this uh, new vision, and it's a very exciting one. So I commend that opportunity to you. So if you've got a child or grandchild, age 3 through the 12th grade, please sign up for one of those meetings. We continue now with the anthem for the morning. Oh. 
We turn now to God's Word. Our first reading is from 1 Peter, the fifth chapter. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary the devil prowls around you, looking for someone to devour. Our second reading is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, the fourth chapter. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. According to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Jesus said, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. The Gospel of the Christ. Please be seated. Would you open your Bibles, please, with me for our text of study today to 1 Peter, the first chapter. If you're using a pew edition, you're going to find that on page 208, 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, for our study today. 
anxiety. It is on the march, is it not? In fact, it seems to be increasing day after day after day. As I reflect on my ministry in conversations with people, I believe that the days that we are living in are some of the most anxious days expressed in people's conversations, their fears, anxiety. Barnes & Noble, the bookstore, has reported that there is a 25% increase in books that deal with anxiety. 25% increase, and that's a, that's a pretty healthy increase. Here's the thing, that was before the pandemic. Anxiety is on the march. God is very clear with regard to anxiousness, isn't he? Jesus says in Matthew 6, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit in Philippians 4, writes, Do not worry about anything. Notice here, God is speaking to us by command. This is not a suggestion. This is not God saying, It sure would be nice if you might be so inclined, if you might not worry about a few things, or please, would you do this? I'd really appreciate it. No, God speaks in declarative sentences. God speaks clearly. God here is speaking in terms of command, and he is saying, don't. Don't. As we continue our sermon series today, Q&A, here's the question I want to pose and explore with you biblically. What is God's strategy for anxiousness? What is God's strategy for anxiousness? I think of the two sisters, Mary and Martha. You know the story recorded in Holy Scripture where Jesus comes over for dinner. Martha is busy preparing everything. Who knows what the state of the house is has to have all the details just right. She's busy, busy. And Mary was busy too, the scripture reveals. Mary was busy listening to the Lord. Martha has finally had enough. Turns to Jesus and says, Martha, Martha, you are worried, or you can translate it, same word as anxious, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Now, Mary and Martha, these are two adults here, but can't you just hear echoes of the two of them growing up? It's the child voice saying, Mother, Father, she did this, or she did that, or she didn't do this. Well, it's just translated now into the adult frame of things, isn't it? Don't you care that I'm doing all of the work? And what was Jesus' response? Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and distracted by many things. There's need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The key word there is the word distracted. Jesus says, Martha's distracted by many things. That word there means to be, to be pulled away and to have your attention put on something else. See, there's nothing the matter with serving here, is there? But Jesus is addressing the issue of Martha's distraction, addressing the issue of Martha's anxiety, and what was the rep recipe that went in to the anxiety. But the recipe that went in to the anxiety was being burdened down by something, plus take your eyes off of Jesus, equals 
anxiousness. Anxiousness. So, what is God's strategy for anxiousness? I think of Luke, the 19th chapter. There, Jesus is getting ready for the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The cross is very, very close. The animal has been obtained. And the scripture tells us in verse 35 of Luke 19, it says, after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. Here's another interesting word. That word there, throwing, it means to cast a burden, to cast a burden. So they had the burden of the cloaks, and what were they doing? But they cast the burden of holding the cloak onto something else. That's what the word means. Whatever is the burden that one has, they cast it away from themselves onto something else. Okay, we're ready now for 1 Peter 5. Look with me, please. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. See that word cast there? That's the same word used in Luke 19, verse 35, about the casting of the cloaks upon the animal. It's the same exact word. It's the transfer of the burden. They cast the cloaks onto the animal. The animal then took the burden. Here, Jesus is saying, cast all your anxiety on him. God Almighty, cast all of it. Take the burden and place it on someone. That someone being God. Cast, cast it away. Throw the anxiety. And how much anxiety are we to throw? Cast all your anxiety on him. And the reason being, because he cares for you. To throw it away from ourselves onto him. But we're really good at gripping, aren't we? We're really good at holding on. And so when those things come in our life that make us anxious, we grip and we hold on to them. And the fingers are tight. It's the what if or what now or what will we do? And we hold on to it. Cast, Jesus says, but oh, our grip is really good. So what does he do? He pries our fingers away. He pries the fingers away and empowers the burden transfer. Now, how does he do that? What's the mechanism? Because the call here is to cast. And remember the principle, if God calls us to something, he will empower it. So this is not a turn into self-sufficiency here. This is an exhortation of God, which then carries with it the empowerment that he will empower it. He carries with it the promise that this is what God will do. And so when the Lord Jesus says cast, what's the mechanism then for the cast? The first is the pry of the finger, right? Prying away of the grip. Now what is the mechanism for the transfer of the burden? What's the mechanism? Let's go now to Philippians, the fourth chapter, please. That's page 175. Turn there, please. Philippians chapter 4. 
And we'll pick up in verse 6. Paul writes this. Do not worry. It's the same word there. You can translate it as anxious. Do not be anxious about anything. Now remember what's the echo there of 1 Peter. Cast how much anxiety on him? Cast all, right? And now you've got Paul saying, do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The empowerment then of the transfer of the burden of the anxiousness, the empowerment of that is through the vehicle of prayer. God calls us to pray, inspires the prayer, motivates the prayer, and that is the vehicle whereby there is the transfer of the anxiousness unto him. That's the vehicle whereby the cast occurs. It's through prayer. You know, I've heard some people that will advocate what you should do each day is you should set aside a certain amount of time for worry. And you say, this is when I do all my worrying. And so you set aside 10 minutes or 15 minutes they'll advocate for, and you you worry. And then you say, okay, I'm done worrying now because I've had my worry session. Uh, How biblical is that? Not at all. Right? Because, because God does not say, have no anxiety about anything. He doesn't say, don't worry about anything. But what you can do is you can take 10 minutes and just focus it all there. No, no. There is that constant transfer unto God through the vehicle of prayer. So in other words, by God's grace, we take what would fall on the worry list and transfer it to what list? The prayer list. Right? Because now instead of being distracted by that which has been put on our quote unquote worry list, it is thrown, the burden is cast onto the other, unto God, and the eyes are not distracted like Martha was that pulled her away from that which was truly important. It's not distracted onto the anxious list. It's moved to the prayer list. There's the transfer. Look at that verse again. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, here's the vehicle of the cast, by prayer and supplication. Now notice how it gets more detailed. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. What's the thanksgiving for? As we pray, we are thankful that God is sovereign and all-powerful and knows every hair that falls from the head, the bird from the sky. God knows all about us. And so there is that thankfulness. When prayer is coupled with thankfulness, there is release, is there not? Because we are reminded when we transfer the burden, we are reminded of the one to whom we are transferring it to. When we thank God for who he is, that assures us of who he is and that he indeed has power and is sovereign over all. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now notice what happens then. Verse 7, and the peace of God. See, instead of the anxiousness, what's happened? It's been replaced by peace. Why? Because the burden has been cast. The burden has been cast. And so the peace of God, of the awareness of his sovereignty, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, which is far greater than any comprehension we have, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Guard is a military term here in the Greek. It means to post a sentry. So the sentry is posted here. 
The transfer is to God. The peace then comes. The sentry is posted where the heart and the mind then are guarded. And where's the assurance of all of this? In Christ Jesus. Remember, every promise, Scripture says, has its yes in the Lord Jesus. He pries the fingers from the grip. He says, cast. And he empowers the cast by the prayer which he empowers. What else? What else? What else is involved in the mechanism of the living out of the cast that God does? Let's go now to Matthew 6, to our gospel text. Matthew 6, you're going to find that on page 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, verse verse 31, rather. Jesus says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? Let me ask you this, where is the focus there? The focus is on what list? It's not on the prayer list there, it's the distraction onto the other list, right? That's where the focus is. That's where the distraction has gone. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? For it's the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Here's the mechanism of the cast. Verse 33. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be given to you as well. You see the replacement of the focus that just occurs here? Just as God says, no, no, no. The the focus isn't on the worry. The focus is on the prayer. The focus isn't on what am I going to eat? What am I going to, what am I going to wear? Fill in whatever the question is. No, the focus becomes then on this. Strive for this. So what are we supposed to strive for? Strive first for the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? That's his reign and his rule. Now here's the grace in all this. The Lord Jesus Christ is calling us to strive for that which he's already given. God has already come and claimed us as his own in the waters of baptism. God has already called us his child. We're already wrapped in the victory of what Christ won on the cross when the Lord Jesus Christ bore all of our sin, including all of our anxiousness, upon him. Including all of the times when we don't act as if God's sovereign. All of that borne by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Debt's been paid. The tomb is empty. God now empowers us to strive for the very thing that he has already given us. You see, that's a transfer in focus, isn't it? That's the transfer when one then focuses on his reign and his rule in our life instead of, boy, this sure concerns me over here. See, the focus then that God inspires is to focus on the gift that he has already given His reign and rule. So the prayer then comes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your reign and rule in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for your reign and rule. Then you can fill in the the blank of whatever area it is that you're tempted to be distracted upon. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your grace. Strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be given to you as well. Here's the thing. We are called to strive after that which is right, that which is God-pleasing, 
with full awareness that we've already been made right through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're not striving to somehow earn our salvation. We are striving in the full awareness that in the eyes of God, the perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ has already been applied to us and we are wrapped in that. What's God doing here? Now don't look here in all that worry. Look here. Look at who you are. Look at the kingdom that you are in. That you are my child. Look here in the righteousness that is already yours. He pries our finger from the grip. He calls us to cast. And then he empowers the mechanism of prayer and striving for what he's already given us, his kingdom, his righteousness, and the attention shifts. You know, I would dare say, I would dare say that in probably quite a few of those books that Barnes and Noble has indicated prior to the pandemic, there was a 25% increase on anxiety. I, I would venture to say that in a lot of those books is going to be a chapter, something entitled, Don't worry, things are going to work out. Don't worry, things are going to work out. You don't have to live very long, do you, to realize that things don't always work out, do they? They just don't. I mean, how many times in your own life have you said, well, that didn't work out. That didn't work out. I like how Lloyd Ogilvy put it. Ogilvy put it this way, quote, things don't work out. God works out things. Things don't work out. God works out things. What did Paul say? Romans 8. We know that all things work together for good. We know that all things work together for good. Including those things that don't work out. Notice Paul isn't saying here, we know that all things work out. No, he's saying we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Things don't work out, God works out things. Cast all your anxiety on him. Because he cares for you. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Therefore, do not worry. Strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. How good is God that he pries our fingers continually from the grip, empowering the cast. Let us rise and confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the blessed. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Please be seated.
August 21st at 10 a.m. We will be having a memorial service for Kent Dabney. If you would like to attend, you are welcome to support Karina and Kent's friends. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty Father, we thank you for the daily provision and blessings you provide. We ask that we would welcome your love in our lives and guide others to your mercies, giving all glory to you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious God, thank you for empowering us to cast all our anxiety on you, to replace worry with prayer, and to treasure your reign and rule over every aspect of our life. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Merciful Lord, trusting you, we ask that your healing comfort and peace be with Don Pappendorf, Morgan Giles, Ava Pappendorf, Paul Yortzvang, Judy Lang, the Mersch family, Mike and Lena Zimmerman, Linda Baraklov, Azenith Knudsen, the father of Maria Berenger, Nick Cole. Comfort all who grieve, especially Carol, Wendy, and family, as they mourn the death of Pastor Meyerhoff. And hear now, O Lord, the prayers we hold on our lips and in our hearts. Into your hands, Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your goodness and mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, our Lord took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Your ushers will guide you forward to one of the communion stations. Please dispose of your paper liner and uh, cup after communing and returning to your seat. You are all invited to this table of grace.
Please rise. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ now strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Almighty God, you provide the true bread from heaven, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant that we who have received the sacrament of his body and blood may abide in him and he in us, that we may be filled with the power of his endless life, now and forever. Amen. Pastor Malinek and I would be pleased to greet you in the extended narthex following the service this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and to be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you of his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.